Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you from Vitality Stadium. We're here to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the Cherries and for those of you who haven't tuned in before, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm here in place of Chris Temple today. Last time he ditched us for the Euros, this time he's only gone and ditched us for the Olympics. In all honesty, I don't think it's too bad of an excuse. Anyway, I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear that there's one constant on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast, and that is my co-presenter, Neil Perrett. Neil, how are you? What's changed? What is new? I'm fine, Zoe. Thank you for asking. Um, What's new? The country's opened up at last. I finally took my mask off after two years and my wife was horrified. (laughs) Wasn't just your wife there, Neil. (laughs) Well, Neil, we are in for a treat on the pod today. Our guest this episode is a man who's made 324 appearances in all competitions for the Cherries, as well as captaining us in the Premier League. He's also recently taken on the role as assistant first team technical director, working alongside Richard Hughes. So I'm sure you can guess who it is from now. But I'm delighted to introduce Simon Francis to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Frano, it's great to see you. How are you and and how's your summer been? Thanks, Zoe. Thank you, Neil. Good to be here. Um, It's been a good summer. It's been a different summer, obviously. Being a player, you normally you finish the last game of the season. Your first thing you think about is going on holidays, taking the kids away taking the missus away and, and having some downtime. But even now, not, not being a player, it's just been so hard to get away really abroad, obviously with the whole pandemic and everything that we're, we're going through right now. So it's been a good chance to spend time at home. Um, been getting into landscaping, which is unbelievable to say. I never thought I would, but doing bits in and around the house. And Neil came over when, when I'd finished the season and and got to see the house and there's some little bits outside that need, need doing. So when the weather's good, I, I get myself out there. Um, the kids being off school now, which is great. Spend more time with them. And then we're back into to pre-season and the busy time that is the transfer window. So, yeah, it's, it's all systems go again, but excited for the season ahead. Yeah, it certainly sounds uh, sounds very busy. Well, there is a lot that we want to talk about. You have been here for 10 years, but we'll start with this exciting new role for you. Tell us a little bit about it and, and just what it entails. Yeah, well, it's certainly exciting for me. So um, a, a passionate, a, a passion of mine within the game that I've had probably since since I suffered my ACL knee injury um, and being close to, to Richard Hughes as a friend first and foremost off the field and having played with him as a teammate, he first gave me the insight into that side of the game. Um, I was weighing up my options as a coaching in, in a coaching capacity along with a few other players. We did our B licence down at the stadium um, and I did enjoy it, but I didn't necessarily have a love for it. I loved learning under Eddie, the, the side of the game, and he always said, you should go and coach, you'll see the game in a different way. And he was certainly right about that, but at the same time, he, he kind of put me off the coaching side of it because of the hours he, he put in, the intensity, everything that he gave to the football club and, and the sport was almost something that I wasn't ready to go straight into. Um, I wanted that little bit of time away from the grass and recruitment gave me that. It meant I could spend time at home. I watched a lot of games, I watched a lot of players, especially last season when we weren't allowed into stadiums, which was tough. And then the natural progression this season, which has been to step up to work closer with the team and closer with Richard Hughes, uh, which has been excellent for me and I've, I've loved every minute so far. What about the punditry, punditry side of things? Did you used to do some of that as well? Has that stopped now? Yeah, I've put, a, put that on hold, Neil, for now, because I, I didn't think it would be the right thing to do is carry on that whilst I'm in this role as assistant, first team technical director. I think this takes up a lot more time, certainly, than last season. Where I was, I was at home a lot, couldn't go and go to games, so a lot was being watched on, on the laptop and on the telly games. And then I'd be invited up to a Sky game to watch whether it was Bournemouth or not. And I just wanted to, to weigh up both those things, things and see what I enjoyed. And whilst the punditry was great, uh, I still had the passion for the recruitment side of things and watching players and, and seeing who I think would fit this football club, that kind of personality, the character. And that's certainly the road I wanted to go down. So, yeah, I've put the punditry on hold for now. So you said about um, when we spoke to you after you'd left the, left the club as a player this time last year, and I know you weren't too sure what you were going to do, whether you were going to keep playing or not keep playing. Did you? Would you fancy a couple more years somewhere? Um, the honest answer was no, I think. Um, I didn't tell my agent that for about four weeks because I was just waiting to see if he did give me a call. And, and, and in all honesty, the only calls I had were Southend, Mark Moles um, and Brian Stock at Weymouth. And I had to let them down gently, but straight away, really. I, I just had to be honest and say I'm just not up for it. Um, I think I would have, I would like to do another year here in the championship un- under Jason, but that wasn't to be. Um, not in a playing capacity necessarily. I just would have liked to have been in the change room, try and get the boys back in, in that mindset of going again to be promoted last season. But being fortunate enough to go straight into to a recruitment role suited me perfectly. Um, the transitions from retiring 
to going straight into that really helped rather than sitting at home and doing absolutely nothing, which I think a lot of players will find themselves in that situation until you retire. You don't know what you want to do and you don't know how you feel. But I was fortunate in that respect that I went straight into to getting busy and keeping busy and, and here we are now. You mentioned Richard Hughes there, obviously who you're working alongside in. I think it was August 2012. He came out of retirement, returned to the club, started playing. He's asked us to mention a stunning free kick winner at Yeovil that he scored, but uh, we're not going to mention that. So, was there an instant connection with him, or did it take a while to get to know him? Um, no, I would say there's a there's a there was an instant connection. I think he came back, and we just saw the game in a, in, a, in a similar way. We we spoke about football a lot, and we were close with Harry Arter as well. As three would spend a lot of time off the field together, our families as well down here. Uh, my wife and Richard's wife are very close. The kids are really close. My, our boys playing the same football team together now. They're the same age. So, yeah, we've always been close. Um, and th there definitely was an opportunity there. I always said to him, look, if I retire, I'd love to come and work with you on that side of it if, if it was feasible for the football club. Um, as I said, when I was injured with my ACL, he, he invited me out to, to Italy to watch the under-21s tournament. Uh, England played in. Lloyd Kelly was there at the time. Phil Foden and some excellent players coming through. I mean, they didn't do too well that in that tournament, but it was a real eye-opener for me. Uh, myself, Des Taylor and Richard were watching three games a day, travelling throughout Italy. It was, it was a great little trip for three or four days and I loved every minute of it. And that was where the, the first bit of passion was ignited for me to go into this side of the game. And, and I've got to thank Richard for that. Harry Arter, how is he? He's good. He's Harry. He's still, he's still the same Harry Arter. Um, got to see him last weekend. He came down to the game, to the Chelsea game. We went for, for some food before that. And it was good catching up with him. Um, ultimately, he's in a tough position right now at Forest. He wants to be playing first team football. He's not getting that at the moment. And I, and I know how frustrated he is. He wants to play a couple more years at a, a higher level as he can. Um, and he deserves to do that. You know, he had the best years of his career, he, he'll say, along with a lot of us at, at Bournemouth. And it was definitely sad to see him go, but he's, he's still the same Harry. He's one of my, my best friends within the game. So, yeah, catch up with him nearly every day. There's obviously that link with Harry Arter and Scott Parker, you know, the two of them, they're, they're brothers-in-law. We've got this new management team that's come in. How has that affected your role? How has it changed your role, if, if at all? No, it's been excellent, to be honest. Um, Scott's been great. He's been really open about it. I think it was one of the first, well, I say one of the first, but Neil and Richard explained that, that I was going to be moving into this role to Scott and Scott said absolutely no problem with that. I'd met him a few times, obviously, obviously through Harry and spoke about Scott with Harry and it was always the right fit for us at the football club to bring Scott in. Um, I think he shares a lot of the philosophy and the styles and, and the characteristics that he wants to bring into the football club, which I think suits this, this place right now. It's exactly what's needed. And I can't speak highly enough of him and his team, Matt Wells and the rest of the staff that he's brought with him. They've been excellent. The training I've watched has been of a, of a really high intensity. Um, and I have to say, I'm very excited about the season ahead. Do you have sort of regular conversations with them, weekly meetings, monthly meetings? How does the relationship sort of work? Yeah, it's been it's been interesting, and that's that's certainly a part of it that I'm learning uh, as I go. So I, I like to watch training anyway. I, I love going and watch training. It's one of one of the things I wanted to be involved in the most. And obviously, I had to speak to Scott about that and see if he was okay with me just turning up and watching training. But he's he's absolutely fine with that. I feel like I learn a lot about the team and how he wants the team to play, which then I can feed back to the recruitment department about styles of, of play that we may have within the team and players that we're trying to attract and players that would suit the football club so I think it wor works both ways whenever I see Scott we'll catch up and Richard and Neil obviously would Neil Blake would obviously speak to Scott on a more regular basis in terms of targets and, and players incomings that kind of thing but mine are more relaxed chats about the team how they're doing other targets that we might be looking at so it's, it's, it's been a great dynamic so far um, as I've said I've loved every minute of it and I, I'm sure I'll learn a lot of Scott as well because he's brought a lot to the football club in this short space of time already. Do you enjoy that sort of communication aspect of it because obviously as you say you're out watching first team training you're then feeding back to to Richard to Neil that to the the rest of the recruitment team is that something that that you're enjoying doing? Yeah I absolutely love it honestly I mean <laughs> I thought when I when I would be coming back to being more involved in watch training that I'd miss it more and more, but I don't so much miss it. I just enjoy watching the the boys out there and, and putting in a hundred percent. I remember be, being that player and having that feeling. That, and we were out in Marbella watching them, and, and the heat that was you know, 30, 35 degrees at some days, and they were sweating their hands on their knees after training, the running they were doing. And I remember that feeling, and it's such a good feeling after training because you know you've put in absolutely everything, maximum effort. And they, the players have already bought into Scott's style and philosophy and his intensity that he wants. And that's why I'm so excited about the season ahead because I can see 
a group of players that want to run through a brick wall. You know, you know, we talk about that terminology within the game, but they do want to do that for the manager. And, and, and Scott's been really welcoming for me, and that's been great. At the moment, we're in the middle of a transfer window. You mentioned, you know, coming back for the summer a little minute ago. For you, how does your how does your role differ when we are in the middle of a, a transfer window and when we're in the regular season? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll let you know when the window shuts uh, how, how much different it is. But right now, it's busy, um, as expected. You know, we had some players leave the football club in the summer. We had some loans that were expired, so so those players left as well. So we're already working on trying to replace them because at the moment the squad isn't exactly where it needs to be for the championship. I think if you look at some of the other teams within the championship that had been relegated or or some of the ones that went close last season to being promoted, they, they have a bigger squad than us in terms of first team players ready to come in. Whereas we've utilised a lot of the younger players from day one, which personally I think has been excellent for them. Um, some of them have really stood up to the level and, and been excellent as we've seen in the game. Zano Rossi, Gav Kilkenny, Mark Travers, Jaden Anthony looks like he's been playing there for years. Jaden, uh, Jordan Zamora as well. So the list could go on. They've really done themselves proud, the younger boys. So they've put themselves in a position now where they can say to the manager, look, I'm ready if you need me. And then we can try and add to that as well whilst the window is still open. It, it is a tough window. There's no, no doubt about that, especially with the pandemic and what it's done to football. It's just not the same at the moment. Um, with Without fans in the stadium, a lot of the revenue within football clubs wasn't there last season. So transfers are tighter. You know, you're working on a smaller budget. So it's definitely been tougher. Um, but it's, it's, it's what it's all about. It's, I'm loving every minute of it. I know I keep saying that, but I am. I'm really enjoying it. Um, and whilst the window's still open, we'll try and do all we can to, to build the squad into a, into a better position come, come the end of the window. You mentioned all those players who've come through the academy. It isn't just about the first team. It's about what's going on behind the first team as well, under 21s, under 18s and below them. Now, you're not the sort of guy that just focuses on watching the first team because we've seen you at Canford watching under 21 and under 18 games. Just tell us how important that is for your role as well. Really important for me, I think. Um, as you said, I'm not just going to be turning up to, to watch first team training because I don't see how that will benefit myself and the first team. I, I want to go and see what, what we can produce in the next two or three years. Who's going to be the next Owen Bevan, 17 years old, training with the first team for the past five weeks, done in the world of good. Who's the next Zeno Rossi, you know? As I said, the list goes on. So uh, in regular contact with Sean Cooper as well, Al Connell, um, two guys that I get on really well with, have a lot of respect for them and they're doing a great job at, at their levels of football as well. So I'll be going to watch the game later this afternoon against Portsmouth, see how the boys get on. And it's just that, that filtering back to everybody. So whether it's Richard or Scott, and I say, look, one of the younger boys are doing really well. You might want to have a look at him. If we're ever light throughout the season, we've got to bring him through. I think it would do in the world of good to train the first team. So no, you're absolutely right. I think it would be silly of me to not venture down and, and watch a lot of the younger age groups and even below that as well I'm, I plan on doing that throughout the season and, and making myself as useful as possible So he needs a lift to that game can you help out? Yeah no problem I'm heading over uh, after this So <laughs> so the pandemic I know that you, we have a smallish recruitment team some of whom are abroad just tell us how it's impacted on you because you must have found it difficult travelling and attending games and stuff like that yeah, last season was was a tricky one. And again, my first year within the recruitment role, um, working with Andy Howe and and Craig McKee, Des Taylor, Mark Birchall, and the other scouts, the other guys in the department. Um, but they were they were great with me. It was excellent. The only problem was that I'd say ninety ninety five percent of the games I was watching were on the laptop and or on the telly at home. And you can only get so much of a gauge of a player or of, of a game from watching it like that. You know, you guys know yourself if you go to a game, you sense the atmosphere, you can get a real feeling of a player and what, what they're like in front of a crowd. Whereas last season, the under 23s games I was watching, the younger players I was watching, I'd only seen them play in front of an empty stadium. So then how can I put my name to these guys and say that they'll be brilliant in front of 40,000 away from home? They'll be absolutely fine. I couldn't do that. That's where it was tricky. Um, you can get certainly a sense of what these players are going to be like and how good they are technically or where you see them going and progressing the next two, three years, but it's hard to really say how they would perform in front of a crowd. That was the biggest problem. It was something we'd never expected to be talking about within the game. So we'll have those targets from last seasons that you want to try and stay on top of, the younger boys, uh, the younger players within the game. And then this season will be interesting because now we can freely go back into games, go and watch them again and see, that how, progress see how they're progressing. So that's exciting for me. And then looking at the older players that have already played in front of Bigger, bigger stadiums, how do they stand up to the test and the challenge or even at the championship level already. So 
there's definitely different levels that you have to look into and, and, and types of players and, and that's what we're just learning about now and, and, and what I'm getting interested in especially speaking to Scott the, the types that he would like it's not just about young players who are great on the ball it's all about experience as well characters leaders he can bring into the group so it's been great and I think we're in a good position right now we could, obviously could be better in terms of the squad but we're doing okay just for for supporters who don't know about the recruitment team you, you reeled off some names there but how does our recruitment team compare in numbers to others in the championship and others in the Premier League that's a good question you know I, I wouldn't know about exact numbers at other football clubs, but I would say because of the size of the football club we are, we're, we're probably a little bit lighter than, than other teams. I mean, that's that's probably a no-brainer, really. That wouldn't be a surprise for anyone. But what I will say is that we put in a lot of work. The guys are excellent. Um, Craig McKee and Andy Howe, they do a lot of organising behind the scenes. They're on top of everything. Um, I'd like to think that we cover a lot. Uh, around Europe and, and further afield is tough, as you can imagine, because especially last season with COVID and and even Brexit playing a part, it's been hard to cover a lot of European games. Um, so that's been tough. But I think for us in the short term and for Scott, I think we know these leagues really well. We know the Premiership, the Championship, League One and League Two. Um, a lot of us applied our trade in, in, in those divisions. So we know the players that would stand out in those and those that would suit us. So the guys behind the season have been excellent. Um, I don't think we've, we've left any stone unturned, especially the back end of last season. Even when we didn't know which league we were going to be in going into the playoffs, we, we certainly had two different lists, two squads that we, we envisaged that if we're in the Premier League, these are the targets we can go after. If, if we remain in the Championship, then these are the targets we can go after as well. So that's definitely been an interesting part of it. And now we know where we are, of course, with the season coming upon us, the targets that we're, we're trying to stay on top of, uh, work towards and hopefully get them uh, as well through the door. So without giving away any sort of secrets, how has this window been for this club? Um, again, it's been tough. I mean, I think we're fortunate in the sense that we've got a, a hell of a of a squad or at least a starting eleven when everybody's fully fit. You're talking about Arnaut Danjuma, uh, Phil Billing, Jefferson Lerma, Lord Kelly, Lewis Cook. The list goes on of, uh, for me, Premier League players who should be pre playing in the Premier League week in, week out. Fortunately for us, we've got them in our squad right now in the Championship. So when they are fully fit, if we can get them on board to be performing at the top of the their game, which I think Scott can do that. He's, I've seen him talk to the players, the way he delivers his messages across. He's, his motivational skills are, are second to none. Um, and obviously I worked under Eddie Howe and I see a lot of similarities there in his philosophy and, and the respect that he commands from the players and, and vice versa. Um, again, it's hard for me to say because the window is still open, but I just think once that, that shuts and we know where we are, I think we'll be in a better place. And you are a player playing for a championship club and like you've said you're good enough for the Premier League you think you're good enough for the Premier League that's just give us both sides of that yeah that's interesting I think the problem nowadays is is Neil I think players can be swayed by a lot of things outside the, outside the game outside the training ground the pitch whether that's family whether that's friends whether that's social media the view that they have upon themselves given given by social media, the way they're treated on, on Twitter, on Instagram, the way people talk them up. Whereas I'm sort of from the old school, I, I've played both sides. I started when I was 17, so I came through a, a generation of no social media at all. It was, you, you were told in the change room, the dressing room, it was black or white. That's how it was. Yes, there was agents about, but they weren't as, as involved as they are now. Um, for me, they are heavily involved now in how players think, how players act. And that, that's the difference now. You can have a player who has an unbelievable season in, in the championship and then that's it. They think they, they don't have to play in that division ever again. Um, whereas you have other players who, who have a, a really strong mindset and think, well, I'm at this football club. I'm going to get my head down. I'm going to perform to the best of my ability. If a Premier League club comes, then so be it. But whilst I'm here in contractors of the club, I have to get my head down. I have to work hard. And I think that that's the message that Scott's put across. Um, any player can, can say they want to leave that's not a problem but whilst you're contracted to a football club you have to be a professional you have to get your head down um, and I think that is that's certainly what I'm seeing in training from the players that, that he's got at his disposal the ones that are fit I'm seeing them fight for every ball even in training I think we'll see that as the season starts you'll see a real energy to us um, and that'll be down to Scott and his, his management team the, the, um, the detail that they've put into training um, and I just think there's with my player head on that that's how I would be just 
just um, Zoe hasn't actually popped out. It's just I just keep coming up with all these extra questions, which um, I just want to ask you. Keep those two hats on. Talk about agents because you would you would have had an agent as a player, of course. Yeah, I did, and and mine was very. He wasn't as hands-on as I would see a lot of agents nowadays, um, especially in my later years when I knew the football club, I knew the people that were making the decisions, whether that, that was Neil or, or my close relationship with Richard, I could almost have done the deals myself really um, over the past few years. And a lot of players will go down that road, a lot of the older players, experienced ones, um, they'll be honest, they'll know the, the clubs I've been here for nine, ten years, so I didn't really need to be distant to everyone at the football club and just say I'll let my agent handle that I had the discussions myself um, we were all on the same page every single year that I, that I was here really but agents play a big part I do understand it um, especially for younger players they're not as vocal or outspoken as as a lot of the older school players were back in the day so they do need agents to do a lot of their talking for them sometimes too much talking but that, that is the game that we're in um, agents are part a parcel of it I'm just learning that side of things now um, I'm not in a position where I'm speaking to loads of agents. That's certainly not my role yet, but I'm learning about that that side of it. And, you know, they pop up everywhere. As you can imagine, that is their job. Um, and rightly so, to some extent, I get, I get it completely. Players have to have people looking after their best interests at heart. Um, so it's the, it's the side of the game as social media is that, that's not going anywhere, not going away anytime soon. The club paid in the region of £25,000 for you and you went on to play more than 300 games, captain, one promotion to the Premier League and you're now assistant first team technical director. Are those players still out there? <sighs> I, um, Harry Arts are £4,000. 4000 pounds. Are they there? there? No, I don't think they are, Neil, no. Um, I think football's changed dramatically in, the, in that sense. Um, I just think that nowadays you find a player like that and it just it just doesn't happen um you also have to have the manager in place like an eddie howe who can see something in a player to bring out the best in them i think i was at the bottom of the scrap heap so i could have gone for less than that to be honest from charlton um, i really do think that was the case I, I i certainly got lucky in that respect that lee bradbury was here as manager and then i only started to pull my finger out really when eddie howe came back to the football club and that was partly with richard hughes as well i remember the, the days in which paul groves left and then Richard was clo he's close with Eddie Howe, obviously they're very close. And he said, Eddie's coming back. I said, okay, tell me about him. He said, he's gonna bring out the best in you, he's gonna bring out the best in this whole squad. And that's all he needed to say to me. I was almost on last chance saloon that I needed to make more out of my career, the most out of my career that I could, whether that was financial or, or to benefit, play at the highest level I could. And I didn't even think that was gonna be Premier League at the time when we were in League One. So. Yeah, that, that for me, it, it can often be about the manager and the recruitment department spotting these talents. And, and sometimes you do want to try and get that next one. The problem is nowadays you go and look for a, a diamond in the rough or one of those gems at youth team level, level or non-league or league two. And you'll ask about them and already they'll have an agent and they'll already have, have Premier League clubs sniffing around. So you're already back of the queue. They're harder and harder to find nowadays. That's the problem um, because there's more agents in the game. There's clubs willing to spend money. There's clubs like Man City and, and the group that own up to 10 clubs all around the world, so they don't miss out on many. Um, so they're harder to find, certainly, but we'll keep looking and hopefully we can un unearth the next Harry Arter or, or Simon Francis. We are going to go through your career in a moment, but I just want to pick up on something you just said there. You say football's changed agents, social media. In terms of social media, we see it, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, everything these days. For you, when you were in the early stages of your career, social media wasn't what it is now. Is it almost a frustration for you now when you go on social media and you see you know these 17 18 year olds getting slammed on on social media by by people that aren't out there people that aren't you know putting their all into something is it a frustration for you when when you see that for our younger players who are who are just trying their best out there yeah that, that that's certainly the dark side of it and and look don't get me wrong i do have frustrations with the social media side of football but i also know there's there's huge rewards there with it as well we saw what Marcus Rashford did um, throughout the pandemic I, I completely get that and, and there's so many positives that go along with social media and I get it as well I mean my daughter's 10 years old and she's already wanting an Instagram Facebook uh, let her have a, a TikTok account but it's private that kind of thing and she'd sit on there for hours it's just it's just the generation we're in so there's no stopping it I completely get that my worry and my concern with it is over the last two or three years I was seeing more and more players after games looking at their phone straight away searching their name and reading what fans had said about them. And that's where I couldn't understand that they needed someone else and, and, and mostly fans or 
or pundits to, to tell them how they played without them knowing themselves how they played. Whereas the generation I came up through, you'd be told if you had a bad game to your face in the change room by one of your teammates. Or if you knew you had a good game, you'd know because you're a footballer. That's, that's your job to know or your, your family would tell you. They'd be honest with you. Whereas now I think there's a real lack of honesty um, within the game of of how players see themselves. And that's a shame. I, I, I want nothing more than a player to go out there and know when he's played well and he doesn't need 20,000 people on Twitter or Instagram to tell him that. He should know that he's, he's done the right things in training. Or more importantly, Scott would pull him, the manager, and say, you were excellent today and don't let anyone tell you any different. Or if he's not done something well, then on Monday morning, he, he'd be watching his clips back or the analysis department would have set that up and he'll know what he's done wrong. And Eddie was big on that. He was always, always about watching your game back, whether you did well or, or you did something not well. Um, can you correct those mistakes you did? And Or if you did something well, watch it back and see if you can do it again next time. And yeah, it's, it's definitely a frustration for me that, that players rely heavily on what people say on social media. Um, but as I said to Neil earlier, it's it's not going to change anytime soon. I just hope that players can, can not get sucked into it more and more as the years go on and this becomes even stronger. Absolutely. Well, we will get on to your career now. We'll go right back to where it all started. Born in Nottingham, you ended up at Bradford City. Give us your memories of those early days, you know, growing up around there and just starting your career out. Yeah, it was. A, yeah, I mean, I spoke about it before, but it was a real stroke of luck that I got up to Bradford, really. I thought my chance of being a footballer were completely over when I been released from Notts County I went on trial at Notts Forest but was nowhere near good enough ended up going to college to study sports science and then by a stroke of luck our college tutor or, or, or coach who, who did the coaching football there and the district team Nottinghamshire uh, Chris Down his name was still keep in touch with him now he got a job up at Bradford as youth team manager uh, Nicky Law was the first team manager at the time he took two of us up from the college uh, the other boy didn't get in uh, and they signed me on on like a six month trial basis first. Within two months, the club had been had gone into administration. Bradford had a lot of the first team players refused to play, uh, didn't want their wages getting deducted. So the first team manager asked for about six or seven of the youth team players to come up and step up into the squads. And within six months of being at the football club, I was making my debut against Nottingham Forest, my hometown team for Bradford City. So it was a real whirlwind start to my football career, but. But since then, huge ups and downs before joining Bournemouth. Um, I ended up moving further f further and further south of the country as my career uh, progressed. So Bradford to Sheffield United, loan spells at Tranmere and Grimsby. Grimsby, I thought, was in League One at the time when I went on loan there. Turned out when I got there, I realised they were top of League Two. That's how out of the loop I was with, with the lower league football. But Neil Warnock had sent me there off the back of an injury. Um, then to South Southend, met my wife there realised that South End weren't going anywhere fast we'd been relegated out of the championship and then we got relegated again from League One I'd actually had a quite a good season went to Charlton off the back of that and thought this might be the time to kick on a really big football club Charlton Athletic but the manager who signed me Phil Parkinson was sacked and then Chris Powell came in and I didn't fit into that squad and then I'm thinking well this could be it you know a career in League One beckons for me I think that's as good as it's going to get and then as we spoke about earlier again another stroke of luck really that Lee Bradbury picked up the phone and gave me a call and I realised then I had to do something with my career try and get to the, back to the levels that I knew I could do I had the ability to because I'd, I'd played at a good level early on but yeah until Eddie Howe walked through the door that, that, that was certainly not the case I just want to take you back to Sheffield United you mentioned Neil Warnock there what was he like to play under? He was interesting uh, actually he was um, and I speak to Harry Arter about him actually because he, he played under him at Cardiff and he hasn't changed one bit which is great to see because you don't want managers to change. I think he's had the success he had because of how he is. He's, he's one of the best man managers I've, I've played under. Um, I probably wasn't as focused as I should have been on football in my time at Sheffield United. He tried to get me on the straight and narrow numerous times and it was absolutely no fault of his that I didn't succeed at Sheffield United. It was, it was down to myself. Uh, I've always said that. And if I spoke to him now, I'd say the same. And he was great with me, really. He sent me out on loan when I needed to. I thought I'd, I didn't need to go on loan, but I, it was the right thing to do. As I said, I'd moved back home to Nottingham. I was probably going out of my mates too much. I wasn't taking football as seriously as I should. And he'd put you, put the arm around you when you needed to. He'd give you a rollick in if you needed to. And some of those, I'm sure they're on YouTube as well now. If you can see them, Neil Warnock in the, in the, in the dressing room, he was a one-off when, when he gave someone a rollick in, that's for sure. But he got the best out of players. And they had a hell of a squad at the time, Phil Jagielka. Michael Tong, Michael Brown, there were some, some big players there. Um, some players I still keep in touch with now. And 
credit to him for, for still going all those years later, you know, nearly 20 years later and he's still managing at a really good level. Um, and Harry said he's still the same. Excellent man manager. Tactically, I'm sure he'll admit he's not up to date, as up to date as the likes of Eddie Howe, Scott Parker, but but as a man manager, and I think he, at this level, you still need a great squad of players, a good character, good, good team spirit, sorry. And he certainly brought that Sheffield United and all the other clubs he's been at. During that time at Sheffield United, what lessons did you learn from that? Because, you know, you said yourself just then that you could have applied yourself better and, and it was no no fault of his that it didn't quite work out for you there. Is there lessons there that you sort of took into later on in your career? Yeah, I think you, you have to learn lessons wherever you go as a footballer, whatever team you're at. If you can pick up little pieces of information or knowledge from other managers or other players. I, I remember Brian Dean of Sheffield United legend. When he came back to the football club, he sat me down on the side of the bank up at Sheffield United's training ground it's like got tears and the first team train at the top and the youth team are down at the bottom which is really interesting it's a little bit similar to Real Madrid when we went out there and trained there the youth team start at the bottom and it's almost a case of as you look up that's where you could be if you keep progressing if you keep doing well and it's a real good motivational tool for a football club to use and he sat me down and said what are your plans of your career and at the time I didn't know I said oh, I don't know really just, just try and get in the team and see what happens from there and he said you, you got it all wrong he knew that I wasn't apply myself 100% he's like you have to get your head down you've got all the ability in the world but your mentality is miles off it and I, I didn't I never took it on board until again until probably Eddie Howe came to the football club and, and I was seeing younger players I was working the younger players who had a similar mentality they weren't applying themselves all the time and I could see Eddie was getting frustrated with them in training and I'd try and speak to them after training and say look you've got to work harder the first and foremost if you're coming up from, from the youth team the, the least you can do is, is run your socks off every single day um, and I kept having setbacks in my career and I was thinking was it me or was it managers and ended up blaming other people apart from myself um, there was times I got with my uh, with my wife and had Hallie my, my daughter and that was a real turning point for me it was it was like a case of okay well I've got to start providing more for her I've got to start putting this potential at the forefront and trying to use it in, in the best way possible so you take lessons for everywhere you are as a player and every team you're at um, and I got a lot of good advice from managers and players, some that I didn't take on board when I should have done. And that's certainly the way I try and live my life now. If I speak to a lot more players, and now I'm an ex-player, I still speak to the lads within the group or players that have moved on, like Dan Gosling, Harry Art, and even Matt Ritchie sometimes asks for advice and I'm always honest with him the way to go about things because I made a lot of mistakes in my career, but I also did a lot of things right in the latter stages of my career to get the best out of it. So I feel like going through those processes and and that journey that I've been through can, can put me in a better place now and even in the role that I'm at, I'm at uh, watching younger players identifying them and, and what they bring to the group Despite all of that when you, you were in your, your early days at Sheffield United in February 2005 you played for England under 20s in a friendly against Russia at the Valley you clearly had potential it was clearly being noticed how did you, you almost feel at that time you know knowing okay I've been recognised internationally that there, there might be something here for me no actually Zoe the opposite I was embarrassed by it to be honest um, I never thought ever I would get called up for England I didn't think I was ready I think the first time I got called up to the the 17s or 18s I was sat on the bench bench at Bradford and then the England call came and I was I just I was so deluded with, with where I was at I had, didn't really have any confidence um, I thought this can't be real I can't be getting called up to England Whereas it should have been the opposite. It should have really brought out the best in me. And I, I didn't perform anywhere near Osh as well as I should have when I went away of England. I didn't really have an agent at the time. Um, I didn't really have, of course, I had my family and friends around me, but it was all new to me. I, I'd been released from Knox County. I'd been at college for a year and a half. So I didn't really have that that background of an academy or, or anyone else to really get behind me and say, you're good enough to be here. I was playing with the likes of Gary Cahill, par partnered him in defence. Um, some really good players within that group. But I just felt like I wasn't ready. Um, so whilst I should have been on top of the world, I was actually a little bit more embarrassed that I'd been been called up to that squad. Did it almost, being called up, did it give you a, a kick that you needed? Did, did you go there and think, OK, wow, look at all these amazing players I'm playing with. I need to go back and really get my head down. Or, or did you come away, you know, feeling as you did when you went there? No, it gave me a certain amount of, of confidence and belief, but nowhere near what I needed at the time, I think. So I'd been at Sheffield United, I had Neil Warnock, who, who was a great man manager. I'd then been at South End with Steve Tilson, who again was a great guy and I learned lots off. 
but I, I know I keep going back to it, but until Eddie Howe put his arm around me and we had some real lengthy chats about where I could go with my, my career in the, in, the, in the latter stages as well, I, I was 25 at the time, and I'd always felt like before that I'd, I'd wasted my career. I never thought I'd get back to the top. Um, but we spoke uh, length about different things, different situations in football, how his career ended early. And I didn't want that for myself. And that's when almost, we say, a lot of the penny dropped. Uh, I think for a lot of the players within that squad as well, e even the guys that, that were on the journey from League One Championship in the Premier League, I think they would have all been in the same boat. You know, They all had the potential, but it was there. It was just who was going to unlock it. Um, and it was a combination of the manager and the players wanting to buy into that and work hard. And, and that was certainly the reason for it. Bit of a random one here, but someone in our office seems to think he's seen you cycling around with Matt Ritchie. Is there any truth in that? Yeah, it's not random. That's that's hundred percent true. Yeah, I'm into my road cycling now, Neil. Um, Matt, he only comes out obviously when he's back. So that was in the summer, probably. We did a big one. He might have seen us in the New Forest. We did a hundred miles in the New Forest. Um, a huge ride, which I was not up for at all. But but Matty as Matty Ritchie is, he just goes full in, dives two feet into anything that he does. And there was three different stages. There was a, a 70 miles, 90 miles and 100 miles. And I said, let's just do the 70. 70 was the longest I've, I've ever done anyway. I got into cycling when I did my ACL and I, I started loving it. And he was just like, no, let's just do 100. Let's just do the 100 around the New Forest. And you know what? It turned out to be one of the best experiences I've done. Um, I'd never felt pain like it um, in my legs. It took me back to the playing days, those pre-season days. It took us five and a half hours around the New Forest, but it was brilliant. We were chatting to people that we'd never met before who were on the ride as well. Afterwards, you just felt a, a huge sense of relief and an experience that I'd never had before, really. Something completely alien to me going away from football, but still pushing through those mental barriers and boundaries that you have as a player. And when it gets tough, you're going to carry on. And there was a hill towards the end right near Matty's house in the New Forest and, and the incline was 20%. And it was almost like we were pulling up to it and Matty was like, right, this is the last hill do not get off the bike. And there's people off their bike walking up with it because it's so hard to ride up. And it was like, I felt like I was in the last 10 minutes of a, an away game and we're hanging on one nil. It's like, you can't give up now. And it was just so interesting that we'd done it and we got there, we had a coffee after. And um, it, it was great. I mean, we, we ride as much as we can. I, I do it a lot more on my own now or, or with some of the guys that I've met um, that are local to me. But yeah, we love it. We're always out and about when we can. Matt, he's missing it all the time. He's saying he's desperate for one when he comes back. So I'm sure when he is and he's got a couple of days off, we'll be out again. But it is true. A couple of questions about your time at South End. Can you relive your goal against the Cherries in a 4-1 win January 2008? Yeah, I got very lucky, I think, with that one, Neil. Um, the keeper fumbled it. I don't know who the goal... The go Do we know who the goalie was then? It might have been Schwan, maybe. I'm maybe not sure. Aaron Dar uh, uh, Flavs was it or mm, I don't know if uh, Flavs was at South End so I don't know if it was oh. Flavs then uh, but it was I think it was straight at the keeper to be honest and he fumbled it um, but I took it nonetheless um, yeah it was one of few goals that I scored didn't, didn't get many as you know but it was it was a highlight for me that one so you went to Charlton ahead of the 2010-2011 season making your debut against the Cherries you had quite a good first year there but you only played a couple of games at the start of the following season. What what was what was going on there? Yeah, well, I spoke about it with Zoe. Um, Phil Parkinson signed me from Southend, and and I thought that was that was it. That was the chance to step up. Now a huge football club, um, right on par with Bradford, probably bigger in terms of the, the fan base and and the level that I played at for a number of years. And I was really excited. I, I love Phil Parkinson. We got on really well. Um, I thought he was a great manager, and he'd gone on to prove that afterwards as well. And we'd been on a great run in League One and I was playing every single game. Um, and then he got sacked and it coincided with the birth of Hallie, my daughter. And again, for a few months, I wasn't applying myself as, mo as well as I should do. Um, sounds silly, but I was probably, I don't know, probably doing the night feeds and not concentrating on training enough and my levels went down a little bit. As I said, that coincided with Phil Parkinson losing his job. Chris Powell came in towards the end of the season, steadied the ship a little bit. And I could tell straight away that I wasn't going to be in his plans pre-season. Having said that, I knew this was my opportunity to, to be at a big football club. So I came back the fittest probably I've ever been since, uh, until I came to Bournemouth and running was part of our DNA. But I came back and smashed all the pre-season tests, the fitness tests, because I wanted to prove a point to him. I said, you're going to pick me. I'm going to make sure of that. 
And actually I was completely wrong. I was training with the kids by the end of the first um, couple of weeks of pre-season. And that's just how sometimes our football is. Your face doesn't fit. And mine certainly didn't with Chris Powell. I think he'd been told by the people above that we needed new players, we needed a new squad. Um, I think Carl Jenkinson was playing ahead of me in the team at the time, ended up going to Arsenal. So that was probably one of the reasons they wanted to financially benefit from that. And I remember training the reserves with Gary Doherty, Tottenham legend. Uh, we had a great time, but it wasn't great for my career. And, and as, as I've said, Lee Brad Bradby picked the phone up and he actually did it early stage of pre-season. I said to him first, I said, look, Brad, I'm going to give it a go here. I don't want to come down to Bournemouth yet. I think I've got a chance of proving the manager wrong. And he was like, no problem, fair enough. And I, I guess I got very lucky when he made that second call. I think Nathan Byrne got injured. Um, so he called me up again. I couldn't have said yes quick enough. I was on that M3 as, as quick as you could say. When that move did come about alone initially, the first game you were involved in, do you remember it? Gillingham. No, it was a 6-0 defeat. Oh, I was on the bench for, sorry, I thought you meant the first one I played in. No, yeah, you were on the bench for that, that one, on yeah. One. yeah. You were an unused sub that day and it did sound like a good one to miss. Yeah, I was just seeing if the ink was dry yet on the contract I'd signed. Because <laughs> we got absolutely smashed away from home. Um, but if anything, I thought, well, at least I'm going to play the next game. Because <laughs> they they're going to have to put me in. Um, and as they say, the rest is history. Look, we had some great times under Bradders and, and still a friend of mine that I catch up with every now and then when I can. Um, inherited some good players for the level, League One. And then Paul Groves came in and I thought imp implemented the style of play that Eddie then took on to the next level, a possession-based football. And yeah, just progressed there. And I was I was desperate to be on, on that journey and, and be a part of that. And so were the other boys as well. They sensed something special was, was coming, especially with Max Denham coming into the football club, Eddie Howe coming back. We knew we were onto, onto something good. When Lee Bradbury left, what was going through your mind? Because obviously you, you've just said how keen he was to sign you. He picked the phone up again. He wanted you at the club. When he left, what 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 was going through your head? Yeah, I was gutted for Bradders because you know we were friends on a personal level as well. So that was always a a difficult part to take. But again, I'd been in football long enough then to know that managers come and go, um, and if you're not getting the results on the pitch, then that's going to be the case. Um, Paul Groves came in and. What can you do as a player? You have to get your head down and, and buy into what the next manager wants to do. And as I said, I thought he impl implemented a really good style of football. Paul Groves did. Um, we were passing the ball. We were keeping the ball off teams. We just weren't scoring enough goals and we were conceding. And, you know, sounds simple, but that is what football is. Um, and I think when there was a, a sniff of Eddie potentially being available to come back, I don't think there was any, any doubts in anyone's mind. If we could do it, then we were going to do it. Um, and yeah, we we'll always talk about the first day when Eddie came back. It was, it was special. We went for a walk down to the beach, and he, he pulled every single player individually. And he'd, he'd clearly been out of his way to, gone out of his way to, to watch all the all the players, all our players within the squad, know know their strengths, know their weaknesses. And we, we chatted for about 10, 15 minutes, and he must have done that with every single player. And, and for me, I've never seen a manager do that on the first day of, of them coming into the job. And even from then, the, the players knew right, well, this could be it. It was going to be something special. Does that just sum him up, the fact that he, he took you all down there to do that? Yeah, it does. And when we continued that, that was that was certainly a um, a bit of a ritual for us. Once every couple of months or, or once a month, we'd go down on a Monday morning, win, lose or draw, um, go and have a coffee at West Beach. And sometimes if, if it was summer, we'd go in the sea and use that as a bit of an active recovery. And also it'd be a chance to mingle with, with fans as well. You know how, how this football club is with the community and the fans. And Eddie was big on that go down and, have, and give someone a chat for five, ten minutes. Um, can make their day sometimes for some of the players and, and the fans alike and the manager as well. And it was nice for us to be seen out in the public. I think that was always big on Eddie's mind for us to be close and connected to the fans who'd, who had been and, and are still so special to this football club. So he was great like that. He always had ideas for the team to always want to be doing something like that. And, and I'll never forget that first day when he came back. When he did come back, he'd been at the club. He hadn't even been at the club a year. Did you know much about him initially? No, only from what some of the players that were still there from his first time at the club before he left for Burnley. So Harry, in particular, um, who had spoke very highly of him. Of course, he wasn't the levels that he was as a manager and as a coach from the Championship to the Premier League days because he was learning as well. He was still a young manager in the game and I'm sure he would have learned a lot from his time at Burnley and even the first time round at Bournemouth. And it, I always spoke to him, well, I spoke to him towards the end of our time at the football club and said, what, what did you do when you first came into that club? You, you, I can't imagine the centre-halves were splitting then and we were dominating games when we were trying to stay in League Two um, on minus 17. And, and he said, no, you, you look at the strength within the squad. 
you work out a way to win games and you go with that. And I think they played to, to big Fletcher's strengths and got the ball to him and, and got runs off him. And, and for me, that was a sign of a good manager. You look at the squad you have at your disposal and you think, how can we get the best out of that? And I think fortunately for him, and he'll say that, he did inherit a very good squad for League One level. We had some very good players and we proved that. We went up to all the way to the Premier League and played hundreds of games there. So 100, 100 games there or whatever it was for some of the other players and myself. And yeah, I, th I think it was a, a combination of both the manager coming back, the timing, and then the players realising this, this was going to be our chance. Always an absolute gentleman to deal with as a member of the press was Eddie. What was he like behind that changing room door? Did you ever see him lose his temper or anything like that? Yeah, I certainly saw him lose his temper. Yeah, he's, he's a manager, so you'd expect that. Um, but at the right times and in the right way. There, there was never any times when I thought he was over the top, he was out of order. Absolutely not. And, and I was on the end of some of those rollickings. Um, and at the time you think, well, that was a bit harsh. I don't agree with that. But then you'll watch the game back and on a Monday morning, you'll know that he was spot on. And he always was, to be honest, even when he was giving positives out and you, something you hadn't noticed in a game that you'd done well, but he had picked up on or in training session. He was so meticulous. His attention to detail was phenomenal. Um, for years and years, he wanted to take every single session, every part of the session, the defenders, the midfielders, the attackers. And only really after a few years and when the games were coming thick and fast and the championship and then the Premier League, he realised he has to dedicate some time to, to Jason Tindall, Stephen Purchase and because he couldn't do everything. He wanted to do absolutely everything and he was good enough, but he just couldn't. Um, and I think that was one of the, the best times for us in the Premier League when, when we sometimes split up into blocks and the defenders worked very hard for an hour or so. So did the midfielders and then we'd come together at the end. And he was always evolving as a manager and as a coach. Um, and you could see that. And we were doing that as well as players because at the moment you stand still as a footballer, I think you end up moving backwards. You, you end up slowing down and course time catches up with every player physically uh, it did with me certainly but if you're always willing to learn uh, especially under someone like Eddie Howe you're always going to improve Do you still keep in touch with him have you heard from him or? yeah a few times I mean we always keep meaning to especially with Richard and his, his younger boy because Eddie's boys are similar age as well we, we want to go around and have a kick around in the garden um, spoke to him a few times on the phone especially since I was moving into this role and, and just having a chat about things just briefly more than anything, not, not not anything too in detail or serious about our time, just almost as friends now more than anything, because you never have that when you've got a manager-player relationship. At, until the last year, really, when I was injured quite a bit and I was out from ACL, we, we'd often have chats and it was sometimes never about football at all. It was just about family and and that kind of thing. And that's why he's so great, because he's, he's very open in that respect. Um, when it's about football, he, he's serious and he's, he's concentrated 100%. But outside of that, he's, he's a great guy and... You know, I'm, I'm sitting here like a lot of us waiting for his next move and, and very excited about it as well. I know you could talk all day about promotion to the Premier League, but I know you want to get to Canford. So just sum up that season in, I don't know, two minutes, if you like, if you can. <laughs> uh, the best season of, of my career. Um, and it does seem weird to say that. And, and I always say to Matt Ritchie, if, if, if we're ever together, or Harry, was that really the best season of our, our, our career? We had five years in the Premier League. Why, why are none of those seasons the best? Um, and the answer is because we were working towards something that meant we were going out every single game knowing we we're going to win or wanting to win and that, that is the very least and don't get me wrong that mindset is, is absolutely needed in the Premier League but the reality is we weren't going to win every single game whereas that season we genuinely had that belief every time we stepped on the pitch we're unbeatable that came from Eddie, that, that came from the confidence we'd built within training in the week. Um, we were training so well that we'd go into a game thinking, yeah, we're going to blow someone away uh, this weekend. The Birmingham game sticks out. It's like someone was going to get that at some point that season because that's how we were performing every single week. Everyone knew their jobs, the combinations, the link up, the rotations, the patterns of play. None of that was by chance on a match day. It's because how hard we worked at repetition every single day in training. So it just came natural in a game. So that season for me was was extra special. All the rewards that come with the Premier League, financial, being in the limelight, playing against the best players, all that kind of thing, the best stadiums, of course, the family that you have to get 10, 15 tickets for every single away game. Although that's not very exciting because it's, it's more stress than anything the night before. Um, that's all special, of course, it is to play at the top of your game in the best league against the best players. But the championship for out and out enjoyment that, that one-off season was, was up there or well, it was sorry that was the top lots of highs and lows 
in the Premier League, f- personally and and for the club. Let's start with those highs. A personal highs for you? Can you anything that springs stands out? Yeah, I mean, just being captain in the Premier League was huge for me. It's something I never thought I would do. Um, I only had aspirations of that. I never even saw myself as a captain. I remember looking at the captains I played for, and I played for some unbelievable captains, even at Bradford. Um, David Weatherall, uh, one of the biggest legends ever to play for Leeds and Bradford. And I used to look up to him, not just in stature, because he was a good few inches taller than me, but as a leader and just think, wow, how have you got to where you are? And I was a million miles away from what he was as a player. And I know age plays a big part in that. And I was 17 at the time. But then, as I've said before, you take experiences and, and knowledge and advice as you grow and grow. And until the arm was sat on my place, I think the first game of the season against Charlton in, in, in the first championship season. Um, and no one had told me. No, Eddie didn't tell me the day before. I just saw it there as I walked in. And I felt a huge wave of emotion come over me. And that was when I thought, well, if the club think I can be captain, if, if Eddie Howe thinks I can be captain, then I better start acting like it. I better start leading on, on and off the pitch. And then it was like, at the click of a finger, I, I started to change who I was. Um, the lads used to joke a little bit. It's like, what, so you, you can't come and have a laugh now. You're captain, you can't come for a coffee. And I, for a few weeks, I was a little bit serious about it all and I'd changed who I was. And then I realised, no, you can still be yourself, but you have to lead by example on the pitch. And that was when I started having aspirations of, of captain in the, in the Premier League. And so that, on a whole, that was a huge high for me. Of course, it was individual games, Manchester United at home for many reasons, of course. Um, the biggest one that stands out for me, and I spoke about it before, was coming back from my ACL and then beating Chelsea away from home with Gozo's VAR goal. That was huge for me on a personal level, to be captain then and come back from the ACL it was a little bit of closure for me. Um, something I'd had in the back of my head going through that injury for nine months if I can just lead the boys out one more time then that'd be very special and I was fortunate enough to do that so yeah loads and loads of highs of course playing in the Premier League You touched well you mentioned the ACL and we're talking about a low now I mean that must have been the lowest point for you and did you think that that was it for you then? Um, Yeah there was part of me in my head that I was sitting in the back of a car after the scan um, and they told me it was a rupture um, I, mean, I was pretty upset and I never really get upset about football matters really but that was when I first thought this could be it because anyone over 30 who has an ACL although nowadays sports science is completely different to what it was the chances of coming back to any kind of level that you were before were really slim um, so yes at the back of my mind there was part of me for, for the first four to six weeks of that rehab thinking I'm never ever going to get back and there was loads of setbacks within that pains that I was getting I w- wasn't able to straighten my leg fully so I, I had doubts throughout the whole of the nine months that I was ever going to get back to the to the level I could. But then you get that little bit of light at the end of the tunnel when you're back training with the team and you come off the training field and your knee doesn't swell up. And then suddenly you think, wow, you know, finally I'm, I might feel normal again. And then I got a run of games, managed to play the Chelsea game. And only then after the game, and I, I wasn't anywhere near physically as what I, what I was. I'd definitely lost, lost a yard. My sharpness wasn't there. But I could play centre half and still lead the lads out, and as I said, that's all I wanted to do one more time, or a handful of times if I could. Fortunately, I did that, and then my last game for Bournemouth was against Burnley, and certainly one that I wouldn't like to talk about much more. And I try and forget that one. That is a question for later. That one, but I'm just going to say that um, it's not all doom and gloom because you hold this pre- you hold this Premier League record for the club, the most red cards. Now, oh, that is doom and gloom. Isn't do it? you think they should have all been overturned? Were they all justified or what? Well, I was never, uh, it's probably more annoying that I was never a reckless going in with two feet, that kind of reputation as a player. They're always silly ones, two yellow cards or uh, the Jamie Vardy one away at Leicester. I'm telling you, if we had had VAR, that would have got overturned because I got the ball on that and I was, I'm adamant to this day. And even if I watch that back on YouTube and I try and show my son, he's not having it. But um, <laughs> I definitely got the ball. The other angles, I wish VAR was in place then. Um, but yeah, some of them were silly, reckless. The Wolves one, that was a another time when I thought maybe I'm not good enough to play in the Premier League. I came back from my knee and got sent off against Wolves, two yellow cards, and they were really sloppy ones. The only two fouls I made in the game, but that's the level you're up against. The likes of Traore and Jota, you bring them down, you're going to get a yellow card. So yeah, some of them were foolish and, uh, and silly, but um, I wasn't the reckless type to be flying into tackles, but unfortunate, you could say. Now, Neil has given me the task of talking to you about that Burnley game. Your last game for the club, a 3-0 defeat, but it was an absolute VAR fiasco. 
what was going on that day? Yeah, well, I was kind of glad that VAR took over how bad I had played in the game because it, <laughs> it meant I could try and forget about it because I don't mind talking about it now, of course, because whether it was my last game or not, I'd had so many great games before that. I wasn't as fussed. Um, the problem was that it was part of our Premier League and, and the season that we got um, relegated. So I was gutted on that part of it. Um, but it was the only game that I'd gone into with, with st I still had swelling on my knee. I, I never felt 100% even before the game, but we had injuries. I think Steve Cook was out at the time. So it was me and Nathan Aki at the back and I just started the game really poorly. And then I felt like Burnley were targeting me down the channels. And I always said to myself, if I'm ever that centre half who's being targeted down the channels, then you know it might be time for me to call it a day. And it was a tough game for me personally and, and as a team. And as you say, the VAR decisions were just incredible. I think we went up the other end and scored and then it got called back for Smithy's handball. Some shocking decisions within that. Um, but it kind of summed up my, my game on a whole, the way that game turned out. We've had obviously VAR work for us. You mentioned the Chelsea game work, you know, against us or, or be incredibly harsh on us in that Burnley game. Is it something the Championship should have? Um, I don't think we miss it in the Championship, no. I don't think we will miss it in the Championship. I don't think we'll be moaning saying we're desperate for VAR because I just think there's, it runs a bit more smooth as it is. You know, we've still got the emotion, the atmosphere in there. I think the Euros use VAR brilliantly. Um, I, have to, I have to say, I think because around Europe, there's better refereeing. In England, I don't think we've we've been good enough over the years with it, especially in the Premier League. It's been two stop start. It'll be interesting now with fans back in the stadium how they're going to feel about it because there's too long a delay. I think between decisions being made, referees at one point were never going to check the pitch side monitor. Now they're going to check it straight away, and are, they're not confident enough in their own decisions. I don't think anymore anymore because they know VAR is in the back of their mind. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a debate. It's a talking point. You ask 100 people, it's going to be divided between whether they like it or not. I'm kind of glad it's not in the championship because it just means we can go and try and win games and be successful off the back of us doing the right things and doing things well. If decisions go against us, fine. But I think over the course of a season, they end up evening themselves out. So I don't see it being a massive problem now. I don't think anyone will miss it, to be honest. Now, just before we wrap up, I want to ask you about something away from football. In an article with The Echo in 2015, you said you dreamed of opening a cafe or a restaurant one day. If you haven't already, is that something that you'd still be interested in doing? Or was that sort of just a comment at the time that you thought, oh, I'll cross that bridge when, when I'm retired? No, well, well, I haven't already or haven't still. Um, I don't know if it's still a dream. I, I would love to do it. I would love to, to own a restaurant. Yeah, and I, I speak to Richard Hughes about it a lot. He's, he's involved in a couple around London. Um, and we were close to an opportunity actually before the first lockdown. Um, there was a place in Penn Hill. It was Cruel Sea, a fish restaurant. Um, it closed down and we inquired about it we looked into it um, and we, we just it, the timing didn't suit us actually uh, I'd just finished oh, oh no I was still playing actually wasn't I because it was the first lockdown so it was the back end of the season we got relegated so I was weighing up, weighing up a lot of other things off the field and it just didn't seem the right time anyway and Italian took it over two weeks later and then lockdown hit and we, we thought oh, we've, we've dodged a bullet there we could have been in debt massively because of lockdown but it turns out the Italians done really well because they started delivering in lockdown they've opened another place in Westbourne and then I'm thinking oh maybe we missed a trick with it <laughs> um, so no, it's not really a dream of mine but I, I love going to eat out in restaurants I like coffee as well so it's, it's definitely something I've always had an interest in whether that opportunity will come around again I'm not sure um, and I love, love the area as well I'd love to open somewhere down here but yeah we'll see maybe in the future would you have Mark Pugh as your chef if you opened a restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> what a question. Um, I think he cooks too healthy for, for a restaurant. I've seen him making sweet potato toast uh, with an egg on. I'm not sure how well that would go down in a fine dining restaurant. Um, but no, in all seriousness, Pugh has been excellent um, in what he's achieved for the football club. And then going into that side of things, he's always been switched on and clever and and he's definitely not been that football fanatic away from, from from away from the game. I always sensed that from him. Um, he'd always had a, other interests, and food was one of his. And we'd we'd speak a lot about it. And he's doing great with it. And hopefully that that cookbook that seems to be in the pipeline comes out soon. I'll certainly be buying one. We've got some questions from supporters. I have to say that there were a lot of questions as well. We've had to limit it down to to just eight. Um, Ellie Scammell is asking: Do you miss playing, or do you enjoy your current role more? Um, 
No, I enjoy my current role now. Um, maybe not more than playing. I don't think anything can really replace that feeling of being a, a Premier League footballer at the top of your game. But I'm enjoying what I'm doing now to the, to the most. I think the transition was fairly seamless from, from retiring to going straight into working for the football club. And now I see myself as being a fan um, of the club and trying to do as much as I can to benefit this football club to get back to where it belongs in the Premier League. Now, Oscar is asking whether you have any superstitions and I'm thinking back to Tommy Elphick headbutting the post and found out yesterday that Lloyd Kelly hops onto the pitch as a superstition. Have you got any at all? No, I didn't have any. None at all, Neil. I had rituals, I suppose, but that was more of a timing thing. I'd leave I'd leave at the same time. I'd eat pretty much the same time. I'd do things maybe in the same order in the changing room, but if I didn't, I didn't notice it being a big deal. Tommy was to the extreme. I think at one point he was having the same amount of roast potatoes before the night before a game, honestly, because he'd, he'd won the next day. He was he was crazy with it, Tommy. Again, an, a, a top captain who I learned loads off as well and still keep in touch with now, but yeah, the headbutting of the post, it used to take him 20 minutes to come into the to the pre-match huddle because he was so busy doing all that. But it worked for some. Well, Jonathan Woodgate would drive round the block to make sure that his myelometer was on an even number as well. That's probably one of the most bizarre ones we've well, heard. Well, I think that's OCD, isn't it, rather than <laughs> superstition. Nathan is asking whether you prefer right-back or centre-back. Oh, good question. Um, right-back until I was about 30, 31, and then when I realised I didn't have the the legs as much as I'd, uh, I was under 30, centre-half after that. Troy Taylor wants to know your closest friend during your playing days at Bournemouth. Uh, Harry. Harry and Matt Ritchie. Um, we had a great group, especially in League One Championship. There could have been 10, 15 of us going out for dinner or for a coffee after training. But certainly Harry and, and Matty stick, stick out as lo- along with Adam Smith and Gozo as well. One from Andre here um, on Instagram. Can Bournemouth get promoted this season? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've got a very good feeling. I, I really have, and I, I wouldn't sit here and, and say that if I didn't. Um, I think what Scott has brought to the group, um, as I spoke about the buy-in from the players that I'm seeing in training, even in the games, uh, there's an intensity there that, that I love about us. And I think Scott has brought that, and we have the quality, absolutely. Yes, we might need a, a few more players before the window shuts or as, as the season progresses, because there's going to be injuries. There's so many games within this season. It's going to be tough but I'm very confident. I'm excited about it as well. We spoke about under-21 players earlier. Hayden wants to know, who do you think is our most exciting upcoming talent? Oh, that's a really interesting one. And I, I spoke about it earlier. I think a lot of the younger boys have done themselves proud. Um, probably the one that sticks out for me as being a defender would be Zeno Rossi. I think he's he's come in and been a credit to himself and to the football club. Um, going out on loan last season, did in the world of good playing men's football at a tough level as well, centre half, learning that that side of it where you have to be aggressive, you have to be physical. And then he's come in and he blew the fitness scores out the window on the first day. He was the fittest out of the whole group. I think that set a standard for for himself and for Scott. That made Scott take take note first day and Scott wouldn't have known who he was. He, knew, he would have known he'd been on, on loan and he was a younger player joining us for pre-season. But that certainly sent a message to him. For me, he's backed that up every single day. I've seen him in training every week as a humble boy. He's coming and he's performed better and better every single preseason game he's played, and and now he's put himself in a position where I think Scott can rely on him if he needs to. One from Rowan: What is the best lesson you've learnt from your playing career? We talked about those lessons in the early days. What's the the best lesson you've learnt? Um, I wish I'd known what I knew when I played under Eddie when I was seventeen, eighteen years old. Um, I mean, I know it's not like that, and football changes that as your career progresses and, and goes on. But not just not just Eddie, but everything about the club that we we brought into it, the sports science side of things, nutrition, the analysis. At 17, 18, it was, nobody was batting an eyelid if you were going and having five, six pints after a game or even before a training session, whereas now you just can't get away with it. And I wish, wish I'd known that and at 17, 18 and just lived my life right off the pitch and benefited from it on the field before before I came down here. And one final fan question, this one's from James. How tricky is the scouting process? It, it can be very tricky. I mean, I, I'm still relatively early on in, the, in that side of my career, but last season was hard because as I spoke about, 
not being able to go to a lot of games and sit in a stadium was tough for me. Um, watching two, three games a day on a laptop isn't ideal, but it was part of part of my journey really to, to, to come into this side of, of the game. Um, this season, I think it's going to be a lot, a lot better for me personally, being closer to the football team, identifying targets. Um, but it can be difficult. It's one thing identifying a target and thinking they'd suit this football club, but it's another one, another one making them sign the contract and getting them through the door. So it's, it's, it's a tough process, but one I'm excited about and enjoying. This is one from uh, Neil in Bournemouth. Did you ever have five or six pints before a training session? Yes, I did, yeah. <laughs> but not before I came here under Eddie. <laughs> But definitely, definitely um, in my Sheffield United and South End days, yeah. yeah. Well, Frano, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us on the AFC Bournemouth podcast. It's been great to chat about your playing days and your role now. So thank you ever so much for, for sparing us your time and for joining us. Thank you, guys. Loved it. Thank you. Now then, we'd be really grateful if you could give our podcast a rating on the platform that you're listening on. And it'd be even better if you could give it a share on social media so it reaches as many fans as possible. Our thanks again to Simon Francis and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle. Thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast.